Hey there team, you're listening to Lockie Stewart and as you may or may not know, I'm driven to help people thrive physically, mentally and emotionally and what you can hear from me are tips and stories from myself and my daily life and also incredible people that are in my life uh, on the topics around mental health, fitness and nutrition, three areas that I'm super passionate about and I do believe there is a massive link between the three as well. Um, Tonight's podcast, or today over in Canada, is an amazing mate of mine, Forrest Black. We met uh, three years ago. He's an incredible musician. He's just released a new uh, single called Love Me, which you know is perfect for this, this sort of chat. Um, but when you listen to this chat and the way he explains his um, you know, depression and anxiety and bipolar, it just he really just makes it in such a positive light that it you know it is such a um common thing and yeah i look forward to you guys listening to it and really having you know it makes it laughable but you know it takes the edge off mental health and puts it into perspective of how it feels for someone who's been suffering with it for many years so i hope you guys enjoy it if you do find value please uh, leave some feedback in the in the ratings and uh, share it with friends if you find it beneficial. All right, we are live. Sweet. All right, guys, so thanks for tuning into. It's not really an episode. It's just going to be a conversation b- between myself and my man, Forrest, who is back in Germany at the moment. So Forrest's story is super powerful, hence why I've got him on this call because I know that a lot of people are going to uh, be empowered by his journey and his story over the last four years. Um, but you know, we first met, I think it was around three years ago in Germany. Um, and I, you yeah. know, I was fortunate enough to, you know, we had an awesome connection straight away and you're one of the most genuine people who literally you, it's like, you got blinkers on when you're having a conversation with you, you don't focus on anyone else. It's just like, I've never had, had an experience like that. Um, so that was really cool. Um, and then obviously, you know, I get to learn, got to learn more about yourself and your journey, which you were going through at that time on your weightless journey. Um, to where you are now, and I think when I was there, I was fortunate enough to see you play some music as well, which, bro, I'm so glad it's released now. And <laughs> if you haven't seen it, I'll be dropping it in the comments because it will just make your heart and eyes melt. It's good stuff. <laughs> but, <clears throat> Thanks, yeah. man. But, yeah, brother, if you could just start, I guess, by sharing sort of your story from how you got to a place where you were four years ago, you know, I think, what's it, 90 pounds you've dropped since then? Yeah, I was about 100 pounds total by the end of it. And then I've gone up and down learning how to change my body. Yeah. So, the, But it felt like about a million pounds in my mind. All right, let's talk about that. So I really like, I guess, if you could give us a quick recap on your, like who you were as a person leading up to that point and then what was the turning point and, you know, we'll just sort of have a conversation around that as we go. Cool. Well, get get ready. Sit back. Put your seatbelts on, because I'm about to go pretty pretty fast, and <laughs> we're gonna take this conversation deep. Um, without beating around the bush, I wanted to kill myself. I was suicidal. I remember standing on a stage in Germany, um, playing for about eight thousand people, and it wasn't like a normal show. It was a really bizarre show. There were eight thousand people in our tent watching us play. And then they performed a 13 minute encore. And for those of the people out there who don't know what an encore is, it's where someone continues to, to the one they ask you to play an extra song and then they, they stayed along with that encore and pushed me to perform it for 13 minutes, which is absolutely bizarre. I've never had that happen in all my career. Not like that at least, you know? Yes. And it was an incredible, <laughs> um, an incredibly spiritual experience. It was, I, I think like, it felt like the room was weightless and everyone's heart was in the right place. It was the most calm I've ever felt and the most peaceful I'd ever felt. And for 13 minutes, they sang my song and would not let me stop singing it. Like they would not, like if I took the, the foot off the gas, they pushed harder. And the craziest part about this, while all that was happening, all this love and this incredible moment, I was planning a suicide and I don't know if that was part of the effect of why it felt so peaceful for once, but I would literally come to terms on that stage with how I was going to take my life and I was okay with it. And for the first time I was actually really happy and 
it was also the scariest part of my mind having that much control over me. That was the breaking point. How I got to that breaking point, well, that's a different series of questions. Like a lot of people, I have had a series of events happen to me as a child that impacted me in ways that affected me as an adult. And I never realized just how much power those things had. And I also didn't have the tools or means to identify what they were and how to give it a name. So I grew up, not to get too far into my personal story, but just with a lot of earlyhood, like early childhood trauma, um, just a lot of abuse and just situations that weren't great. And then like, you know, my father went to prison and my mom really wasn't fit to take care of us as kids. She was too young and had, you know, three kids and didn't really have the education and the means to raise these children. And um, my father was a violent and just not, not a really nice person. He's, you know, he's just a criminal. And that ended up leading to my mom not really being able to take care of me. And then I ended up being homeless and then bouncing in and off the streets, trying to figure out who I was. And then eventually leading to the point where I, I found some refuge with my, my grandmother, my Nana, she kind of took me in and helped me out and gave me a little bit of a, just a, a little bit of a like, footing and a foundation. And then from there, I ended up back on the streets and trying to figure out my life and just back and forth between situations that weren't necessarily optimal for a younger person. But it was teaching me a lot. But I was also really angry. And as I became an adult, it was the anger that had really locked itself onto me. And it, I didn't realize it at the time, but anger was the most incredible defense mechanism I'd ever been able to come up with. In, in essence, I was kind of like the Hulk, for anyone who's seen the Marvel videos or know about the Hulk. I'm this nice guy and I have a really big heart and I really genuinely care about a lot of people, but I'm feeling fragile, vulnerable and insecure and very unsafe. And I felt like this Hulk would come out and defend me and take care of me whenever situations were not kind of optimal or good. And at some point it felt like that creature had taken over and it was like always protecting me. So like you could come up and be like, hi. And I'd be like, why are you saying hi to me? Like, it was so crazy. And for years that, that lasted. And I felt like I was losing myself more and more as time went on and it became really scary. And um, to the point where it led up to that, those suicidal thoughts. What I later was able to identify as the problems after sitting with a couple of professionals was that I was suffering from really severe social anxiety and, and really severe depression and that I might have or be bipolar. Wow, what a revelation, like to be able to sit in a room with someone and say, hey, like these are some components to you that might be influencing the way that you're reacting. And it, once I had that in my scope, I was able to go, wow, that's really interesting to give those things a name because then I can actually try and figure out what they mean and how to work with them. So to stay on that superhero analogy, I have I, fast forward to now quickly those things that affect me so intensely anxieties and depression those have become like the greatest tools in my arsenal actually those are really powerful tools um, and really magical components to who I am as a person the anxiety is just my ability to figure out what the feeling is in a room to understand people. It's a gift, really. It's scary when you don't know how it's being used internally, but when you do have that understanding, it goes, wow, like, I'm not really good at being around people. Why should I? Of course, I didn't have that safety in the childhood, and that's, of course I would have this. That's what's kept me alive. That's what makes me special, because other people don't have that, so they're not really feeling the way I feel in a room, and that's not their gift. So that's mine. And the depression, well, I feel so intensely <clears throat> that depression happens to be a side effect of that. I can go deep, deep, deep into a feeling. So those highs are really high and the lows are really low. But, but then I have this gift that I can write a song that feels really low and really high at the same time. And that resonates and connects with people from all around the world. Like how lucky am I? 
Because if I didn't have those, I literally don't know what I would do. I don't know who I would be. So take it back. I was, I think, 29 years old, height of my life. Like, career was going awesome. I was in Canada. We got nominated for a Juno. To Australians, that's an Aria. Or to Americans, that's a Grammy. Um, like, my life was so good. And people, when I finally came out and told people I was suicidal and, like, I was going through all this stuff, it was so funny. Most of the people came back with, um, yeah, but everything is great in your life. How is it that you feel like that? That was probably the most, the sentence that came out the most. I was like, yeah, that's the funny thing about depression. Like, it doesn't matter how good, it doesn't really matter how, how good things are. When you feel something, you feel something. So I was 29, high to my stuff, and then I quit. I quit. I, I remember, like, I was, I was so over everything and i played that concert and i came off stage and i was like just so pumped I'm like it's great like it's finally i've cut this cord like it, it's great everything is great and for the next few days they were some of the best days of my life like i lived so much once i knew that i didn't care anymore and interestingly before i went on that tour um over to germany i had made a friend a brand new friend in canada and we weighed the same and we kind of had similar feelings, both of us not really knowing at the time. I hadn't yet figured out what I had, um, but he felt similar things. And I was like, wow. And we tried to figure out, like being mad scientists, like what was it that made him feel that way? And what was it that made me feel that way? But the only way we thought of doing that was identifying some of our similarities because we were very different people. So here's this person sitting across from me, <laughs> overweight, unhappy, feeling depressed, feeling anxious, and very different life. So it must not be the fact that I'm a musician. It must not, I don't know what it is. And ultimately, the one thing that we came and identified was our food and our lifestyle. It was the only real definitive connection that we had. And coincidentally enough, we were having this conversation over food. I believe it was like a, a fast food burger and like fries, <laughs> you know, and like a, a drink of sugar that's about this big, of, of course. And we realized that we were both doing that multiple times a day. So interestingly enough, um, we made like a pact to get healthy. And I then went on this tour and did not get healthy whatsoever, but he actually started. And um, so in the midst of, you know, feeling the heaviness and like being in the way that I was, I decided that I was going to stick to him and this like kind of deal that we had made before I was going to take my life. And it was really weird how I was starting to play this game inside my head of like, kind of like anything, like I'm not going to drink for a month. I'll start on Monday. Okay. I'll start on the first. Okay. I'll but I was kind of doing that with my own life. I was like, well, yeah, I, I, I'm going to take my own life, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to give this, this new friend 30 days of my life in my time. And, you know, obviously I'm not going to get my life back because I've tried to diet and do stupid things like this for, you know, hundreds of times in the past and it's never worked. It just cost me way too much money filling up a fridge, the stuff that just went bad. And then I was just eating that fast food anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened was those first 30 days changed my life we started to, to identify that there was a, a real serious correlation between mental health and processed food. That was the first kind of building block that happened. And I'm not going to bore you guys with too much of a story, but I can, the thing is I can talk for hours, but I also met a guy who was 700 pounds at the time in a hospital being told that he will never get better. And I happened to be, he was a fan of mine and I saw that he, he made a post on Facebook saying he was in the hospital and I reached out being like, are you okay? He's like, holy cow, like you're messaging me. I'm like, of course, like, you know, I, I, I'm just a person. People don't, sometimes they don't think that, but it's like, yeah. And I was like, can I come to the hospital and visit? Like, you, you need anything? And the guy's like, can you just bring me a CD? <laughs> <laughs> yes. He was like the sweetest guy in the world. And um, I'm like, cool. And I actually started documenting this 30 day journey with a camera. I was like, I have a camera. Can I bring it? And we'll just talk. And I got there and, here he is and he's 700 pounds and like he wasn't able to get his heart checked in a machine they were calling the zoo to see if they had an MRI machine big enough to check. Like it was brutal. 
and he's sitting in a hospital bed that had to be brought down from a different city that's three hours away and it, it stretches like three times the size of a normal bed and um he goes goes on to tell me a story that he doesn't doesn't know if he's going through congestive heart failure or not and he's worried for his life and i asked the doctor i said well, what can this guy do like and the doctor just literally looked me in the face dude and he's like people like him don't get better as he's sitting right here he says that to me and i lost my mind i was like you know what screw you i'm gonna help him get better and i i offered him and said hey can i help you can i don't know anything about health and wellness like obviously like at the time <laughs> like i had a beard this big and a belly that was bigger and i was like but i will i will do everything i can to help you if you want to and he's like yeah at this point like he kind of has like nothing else in his life so he's like yeah absolutely and so we embarked on this crazy journey which started my journey so i didn't really have mentorship per se but i had such a fixation and belief in other people that i was so determined to learn everything i could to figure out how to get better and i failed the whole time but i learned everything and then some that i could have never imagined would be possible and it started with each stumbling like failure that opened up a brand new world it was like it's like trying to open up the door that leads to the secret vault inside your soul and you're opening up every wrong door and not only are you opening them but you're like you're breaking them and like <laughs> you're like walking in on people in rooms like you are figuring <laughs> out so many things about yourself and it is unbelievable because each room presents a brand new version of yourself so I remember reaching out to nutritionists to ask them if they could help me with this guy. And they, they were kind of dismissive in a way. Like they wanted to be part of it because I was like, we're filming it. We're going to turn it into a documentary. We're going to change the world. Big ideas, big dreams and aspirations. And um, they were like on board for that part. But then when they find out he's 700 pounds and actually like if they give the wrong advice and he dies, there's a liability. So people are like, uh, no. And I was like, well, you know what? I'm going to kill myself anyway. So I don't care. Like I will be the liability. And I was willing to kind of like just present him options. I'm like, let's try this. Let's do this. Let's try this. Let's make this. Let's be a group. Let's hang out. Let's be friends. Let's just everything that evolved. So I learned everything. And then we started pulling people together. We found a friend of mine. His name is big Ohms on Instagram. He is the most genuine kind hearted person and a really huge asset to my life and my heart he came on board and um, he's a, he's a, an incredible personal trainer and a bodybuilder from Calgary, Canada. And um, he came on board and, and tried to help this guy out with a little bit more of the physical aspect, seeing as how large he was. Cause I didn't really know anything about working out at the time. And together we spent the next year and a half to almost two years growing with each other. And this guy ended up losing, I think close to 400 pounds and like it was crazy and then we all lost the weight too like and then continued to keep the weight off so long story short that's where it started and it doesn't end because as i'm sure you're well aware just because you start one thing it doesn't mean that it's necessarily your lifelong version i don't think people realize that because as humans we are creatures of progression and our bodies are constantly fighting us and plateauing us. So to break through those plateaus, it's like your body shuts everything that you've just learned down and you got to figure it out again. And it feels like that happens every couple months. So I've never that's heard kind of my, like that. That's gold. Right. You're yeah. welcome. <laughs> so good. Yeah. Trademark. That's, right. <laughs> that's it. But, it's, it's a bigger story and it can go on and on and on. But these are versions of how I discovered it and how I stay focused in it is my life. Like I know what looms on the other side. Like I just went on uh, not a tour, but I had a couple shows. I was in New York, I was in Los Angeles and I'm, I was touring around America and um, I didn't get to work out. I was so jam packed. I, I actually, I, let me, let me take that excuse off the table. I chose not to work out because I was so jam packed and I, I really wanted to sleep in instead of, working out and there's a huge trade-off uh, my mental health kind of went a little weird when i got there it took a few days here i hadn't worked out and i felt that 
creeping feeling come back in where I'm like, oh, I don't feel good about myself. Oh, I, maybe I'm not good enough. And then all those heavy feelings started swirling around. And that's, that's a big thing. I, didn't, I don't want to confuse anybody out there who's watching this. My anxiety is always working. My depression, it's, it's my best pal. It's just always hanging out. It's like that pal that doesn't leave your house and sleeps on your couch and doesn't do your dishes but eats all your fridge food. <laughs> that guy, that's depression. But, but it's just a great pal. Helps you through the hard times, convinces you to do bad things. Um, that, that's what it feels like and it never goes away. I've just been able to control it and bring it down from always being like pinging out a 10 and bringing it to like a manageable one and two at its worst days until I don't work out for too long. Or in the case of what just happened when I was traveling, we were also eating out a lot and dining with other people. And it wasn't that I was making bad food choices, but I could feel that I wasn't eating the way I would like to eat. And in turn, I felt that a bit of my control over my, my superpowers, as I call them, got a little out of control. Yeah. So I think a few of the things that like, that was just incredible to listen to. And you covered so much in terms of like, obviously what was going on for you, how you handled it and what triggered it and all that sort of stuff. And you now my intention for having you on here was that, you know, like, because I know <laughs> I've had, and you're probably the same, like I've had so many mates and people that I went to school with commit suicide and, you know, mental health running rampant. Right. And it's, it's my biggest passion is to help educate people, especially men to tap into their yeah. side of vulnerability, you know, so we can open up and have conversations like what we're having right now to understand that, you know, if you're going through some kind of depression or anxiety, it's like, it's okay to talk about it, call it your superpowers or, you know, whatever it is. But as soon as you can identify that and learn how to manage it and work with it and not work against it, work with it, you know, you can, you're the perfect example of how uh, comfortable and enjoyable life can be with that. You know what I mean? Um, and it's cool to, to hear how you've sort of, done that but um you know for those people who are watching this and wanting to reach out like when you initially you no know, i know you came into contact with your your buddy who's probably one of your best mates um christoph yeah christoph that's just <coughs> Chris, I, is, it, is it christoph chris the guy the yeah. german with the hat no way yeah. is you there yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, my internet just cut out. Is Christoph? Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Oh, no, no, sorry. You're talking about my mate back home. In yeah, the guy healthy. No, that's that's my that's one. He is one of my best friends. Chris, I have Christoph. Yeah, no, I thought you were talking about Christoph. I know. Sure. I know um, yeah, his name. His name is Derek. His name's Derek. Yeah, awesome. You know, so you had Derek to really, you know, you give thirty days of your time to to reach out, and a lot of us in Australia, especially, you know, I know four years ago before I learned to be able to talk about my feelings and stuff. I was just like talk about beers and stuff like that. So what was it for you that made you open up to someone who at the time was a complete stranger, apart from the fact that you guys were sipping on a soda and eating a burger or whatever it was, you know, you were consuming at that time. Like, yeah, I, I, I mean, for, for one, it was like looking in a mirror. I'm, I'm able to go in, like I said, into a room and kind of suss out how that room feels and the people in it right, quite quickly, who's safe, who's not safe. That's just part of my survival instinct. And part of sitting across from Derek is while observing him, it felt like I was really observing myself because there's nothing I could like judge this guy and, and figure out who he was as a person because he's essentially a similar It's it's tough to say, man. I don't know. It's like, you know, when you meet a person that you just really care about deeply and you're trying to figure out why, it's, some, it's not really much to answer. But m maybe it was part that I really wanted a friend in my life and I was actively putting that out into the world and universe. Like maybe I, I was seeking so desperately to have someone that I cared about. I don't, you know, get my, my circumstances as a child, I, I didn't really lead to a lot of strong relationships family wise like i have my nana and that's that's the, my my queen king at the same time like she's everything um but everyone else is just kind of is not a lot of presence so 
sitting in front of this guy and connecting and like, it's just like a connection. It was like, man, I was just so thirsty for, for that time. Cool. So yeah, anyway, I, I have a love and admiration for Derek. I think he's one of the most incredibly flawed and beautiful people in my life. I just really love the guy. He's one of those friends you can call up and say, hey, life just went to shit. He's like, cool. <laughs> Let's talk about it. You know? So again, I, yeah, I, I think it's just part of like, yeah, my internet. just knowing that you're in a place and you want to change or you're seeking something like that. Yeah, man. I think from from your story, man, like it doesn't matter, you, you know, you're hugely successful in your own right and depression and anxiety doesn't just favor the, you know, the weak or the less fortunate and so it can, it can hit anyone. And, um, you know, I've seen it happen to amazing people and, uh, you know, people who aren't obviously striving for as much success or whatever you define it is, you know, not progressing and, um, one of the best things that you said, and it aligns with my passion of human performance and human progression is like that if we're constantly not trying to be that little bit better every single day, it's like we're dying anyway. And it doesn't matter whether you put that to spirituality, training, uh, nutrition, uh, you know, any of that sort of stuff. If you're not constantly looking to improve your body, age is going to do its thing. And then your excuses are going to start creeping in just like, um, you know, the people who feel sad or, you know, link that to depression. It's like you get to a point where it's just like you don't feel like you're enough. And, you know, it's, it feels like, man, one of your posts was amazing. Uh, it feels like you got the weight of the world on your back, right? Um, yeah. And often when you're, you know, walking around in that state, people, a lot of people don't, understand what it feels like and they don't know how to treat or act you so they're like oh just get out of it you know you know do that but they do that with the best intentions but they just don't really understand how that feels yeah obviously i'm um, sorry i'll just hit record again sorry guys for the technical glitches that's going on but um yeah. No, this is part of life. These glitches yeah. are great. Welcome <laughs> to real life. This is yeah. what this is what we're talking about. You have these glitches and it's okay. <laughs> um, Nothing is perfect. It's all an illusion. Exactly, especially my mustache. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's an incredible illusion. Yeah, it's hopefully. But you know, it aligns with what we're talking about right now, men's health, mental health. Um, no, so going back to, you know, you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders and often um, you know, the people around you who may notice that something's up with you or something's different, the mood swings and stuff like that. So many people don't know how to handle it. You know, they don't understand what you're going through. So they can often, you know, smart ass remarks or everything's meant with the best intentions. I get it. Cause I used to say the same to people who were close to me until I experienced it. It's just like, pull yourself out of it. Come on, mate. It's nothing like you're doing this, but to the person, it's the biggest issue in the world. And you know, yeah, it's the biggest thing they're going through in their lives yeah. right now. You know, it's, it's not to cut you off, but it, I wonder if people have ever thought about it. I think it's a, a sign of our times. It's like if your phone starts glitching, you're, you're literally in the palm of your hand for the most part. People are holding something that has more technology in it than the first spaceship that went to the moon. So, like, people don't often think about that, but that's literally true. Um, if that glitches for about two seconds, like we get frustrated. Look at us in this call. So the, the Wi-Fi drops, you're getting frustrated. Oh, why is this happening? Not now. This is a great conversation. No. But really the challenge is a lot of us don't know how to handle those things. And then we in turn don't learn the skill set to handle things. I know I didn't. I struggle with it every day. Communication. I may sound great talking right now, 
But when I feel so intensely, that becomes very hard to communicate like this. Most of it's reactive and hyper emotional. The, the, the biggest thing has been having people in my life who understand that and allow me to run wild a little bit to then cool down and get at it because then we could talk. They let me become the Hulk for 30 seconds and then I can chill out and they go, now do you like how it felt to be the Hulk? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everything is broken. <laughs> but we don't have the skill set or I think that it's something that's missing where we, we're not often proactive in the sense of this doesn't work really well. How do we take a look at it? Simple problem solving. Instead, we all become frustrated. And that's yeah. a big problem I see. So it's like when your mind's not working or someone else's mind isn't working, why is it that we're so quick to jump? Why, I understand that it's not really relative to people because they can't understand what it's like to be in their shoes, but it is really relative. If you don't know what it's like to understand what someone is at their worst, just try and think of you at your worst for a second. How would you like to be handled? Because that is literally someone's moment every day where they're at their worst. So instead of passing judgment, how can we pass that compassion as people? How do we extend that branch and say, hey, I get it. I get that I don't get it. <laughs> I get that I don't understand anything that's happening inside of you, but I want you to know that here's a safe place. I'm, I'm here. I don't understand you. I don't understand depression. I, if you don't understand depression or anxiety or bipolar or any of the things that affect people. I mean, like the list goes on and on and on. If you, if you don't understand it, that's fine. Just being a willing participant to be in someone's space if needed. That is what I think compassion and humanity is about. It's like, you don't have to suffer like someone else does to, to, to support them. You don't have to go through what they're going through. So you don't have to be afraid of people when they're falling. But you can be supportive. You can be kind and you can reach out and you can watch them as they go through it and just lend yourself. Sometimes just being there. Sometimes letting, know, letting someone know that you are there. A, a good example, I had a lot of people reach out to me when I came out and said, hey, I'm, I'm suicidal. I've been having these feelings. And... I had a ton of people actually, and it was so wonderful. And they're all like, man, you can reach out anytime. Like we are here for you. I had a lot of people like that. It was an incredible feeling, but they don't realize that it's, it's great. It's a great feeling, but it's so unrealistic for me because when I get to that point, I'm not calling people. When I get that to that point, I'm in a different world of expectations and going, if people cared about me, they would call in the next three minutes. If no one calls in the next three minutes, I'm useless. And I'll prove to myself that my life is shit and nobody should care about me. I'm already in that state. I'm not going to reach out and be like, Hey guys, how you doing? <laughs> I need to talk. <laughs> I have trouble washing my face and brushing my teeth at that point. So those comments meant a lot because it's just support and it's people offering what they think is the best way to support you. <laughs> Though it's not for what I would need, it was still pretty magical and wonderful to the point that it lets me believe in people. I go, wow, they actually do care about me. And that becomes a tool in my arsenal when I get to that heaviness where I go, hey man, you don't have to have this weird expectation over yourself. It doesn't matter if nobody calls. Somebody not calling doesn't mean someone doesn't care about you. And I can start talking to myself so again, to come back full circle, I think it's just a matter of letting people off the hook a little bit and realizing that we're fragile. Listen, the world is stacked against you. I said at the beginning of the conversation, 150 years ago, your biggest problem is trying to make it to the outhouse before your feet froze. So it's like life is like really complicated right now. You have technology that's crazy. It feels like every year the generation, the generation gap feels like a year now. It doesn't feel like 10 years or 20 years. It feels like the kids born in 2016 are already smarter than the kids born in 2000, you know, 15 and so on. And it, it feels like you can't keep up. I'm like, I'm going to have to pump gas for a living for as long as there's not automation and machines pumping other people's gas, because I don't feel like I can keep up with this 12 year old kid who is like Albert Einstein. But it's like, you got to remember that the world is going so fast and everything is stress causing your drive to work causes you stress. Your money causes you stress. Your phone's causing you stress. Your relationships are causing you stress. The lack of relationships causes you stress. 
your house, the places that you found to be safe cause you stress. What do you wear? Because if you go out, you'll be judged. That causes you stress. Cortisol being released in your body 24 hours a day. Life is like totally stacked against all of you. It's primed to set you up for failure. As soon as you realize that, like let yourself off the hook, you're doing just fine. If you would have put someone 100 years ago under these conditions, they would have failed by, by like week one. And you are thriving. You are an anomaly. You are absolutely incredible. You've learned how to use this technology. You've learned how to drive a car. Like if you saw a monkey driving a car through traffic, you'd be like, wow, I can't believe that monkey stopped in traffic and not smashing at all those cars. Be proud of yourself. It might not seem so impressive, but it is pretty, like pretty amazing. So it's like, take it easy on yourself. You're doing a great job. And maybe, that, maybe people aren't telling you enough because we're all trying to prove on Instagram that our job's already great. <laughs> but yeah. all, all the in between the photos, that's the part that counts. What makes you you, even if you're nuts, even if no one likes you, even if you have no friends, you're awesome. You're the most incredible thing ever to happen in your life. You're the center of the universe. You are literally your own God. And I not mean that in a religious sense. I just mean you take care of you. You control. You can't control what happens to you, but you can control you. So it's just chill out on yourself. Give yourself a break. Take a breath of air. Come up from the water. Don't let it hang out up by your nose so long. Just try and enjoy being human for a second. I know it's easier said because it's, you know, like, look at me. I'm just being a, all prophetic on a, on a call. But it's like I'm fighting every day to stay alive just like the rest of everybody. Just because my job is different and I sing for people. Like, I'm a monkey. I get on stage and I perform for the kingdom. I'm not the kingdom. I'm just the jester. Like, and I know that. And I love being the jester. It makes me feel empowered and important. So sometimes we just all want to feel a little bit more visible than we did the day before. So if anything, if anyone can take anything from this conversation, for however many people see it, whether it's one or whether it's a million, you are so important and you're so valuable. You and all your craziness, you and all your chaos, you are amazing. And maybe someone hasn't told you recently, but that's how I feel about you. Yeah. So good, man. <laughs> <You're so laughs> I'm just mesmerized. But yeah, I think, you know, I had a whole list of, you know, not questions, but sort of ways I was going to lead the conversation. But, you know, you being you, <laughs> being amazing, like you just do that so, so well, you know, your story and sharing and being, I guess, being so vulnerable and taking us through that whole roller coaster of, how it all went about how you you know you were saved or you weren't saved but you provided the opportunity to you know save yourself ultimately no one's going to save us we're going to save ourselves but you know yeah. and then you know looking at two of the hardest things and two of the biggest excuses in the modern day society which i see especially in cities is like people neglect their health because they're chasing the dollar or they're you know trying to impress someone at work or trying to build that instagram and it's like how often do you hear it's like people like i don't feel good about myself it's like well do you exercise or do you eat well it's like i don't have time if you don't have time like make it make it it's 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 a priority because you, you're the your story from when you were at the <coughs> united states and you didn't have the opportunity or you, you chose not to there's not the opportunity we all got it you chose not to exercise and the impact on your mental health and i i know for myself whenever i don't exercise that's why it's a movement doesn't have to be thrown weights around but movement whether it's stretching yeah. or is a part of my day it's like brushing my teeth because i know what the impact can be mentally for me uh, just take a 10 minute meditation break that'll change your life if you, if you don't know if you can't get to a gym because you're not here that at that point i didn't go to the gym at first to get healthy i just started with food if you if i mean that's control you can you can literally decide what you're putting in your mouth that's it um, but taking a 10 meditation, 10 minute meditation, there's apps like calm and headspace. Those really help. Yeah. And it's not like this hoo ha, hoo -da, hoo -da, like it's you, you sit down and you have a voice in a set of headphones that say, okay, breathe in and breathe out. This is what it should feel like. Think of your head. Like, and that really helps quiet it down. It's, it's so cool that you're talking about time and how that works. I developed a philosophy called DAT and I turned it into like a principle that I, I haven't really told anybody until now. I'm like my close friends and a few people I work with part of, yeah, I'm a musician, but I also take on a few people a year and try to help them transform their lives. 
and I developed, I had to like come up with an idea of what it was I was really trying to capture. And I came up with DAT life coaching and fitness and it's three fundamental principles that I feel act as like three gears. And if one of them sticks, the other two don't move. It's really simple. You need all three to all three to work in unison to create success. So my whole big spiel is this, you already heard me say that you are infinitely successful. You are the fact that you exist nuts. So what I think is our biggest challenge as people is trying to take the failure, the curtain of failure that we feel and remove it from how beautiful the skyline of you really is. You want people to see you. You want to be visible. Let's remove that curtain of doubt and failure that you're going through. How do we do that? It starts like this. D stands for discipline. If you don't have the discipline, you're already missing a component. That's probably one. And you know, they're all equal, but I'm really privy and really, I really feel, you know, I feel really um, adamant about discipline because it's a choice. It's hard, but uncomfortable doesn't mean bad. Uncomfortable usually means that there'll be something great that comes out of it, but humans don't want that. Humans are geared mentally, scientifically, you are geared to fail when it comes to comfort. You want comfort. You will do the thing that's comfortable 99% of the time. Discipline requires that you at times to make the decision to say, hey, I'm going to feel uncomfortable. And so, just, and, sorry. I would jump in, but like the biggest thing, I my discipline is, I believe, one of my best things. And the reason, the the biggest thing that changed discipline for me was like, if I'm, you know, a disciplined enough monkey to go to work every day and work for someone else, you got to look at, okay, I'm spending eight hours of my day going to do something, and a lot of the time I don't enjoy it, and that's taking away eight hours of my day that I could spend with my girlfriend or doing, you know, it's it's every decision that comes through discipline you're sacrificing other stuff so you want to make Absolutely. sure you know if the decision to eat a pizza instead of uh, <laughs> whatever it's like it may taste good now and feel good for the next hour but what happens after that that's just it it's like so you you lose something and you yeah. essentially don't take down that cloak of failure you feel like a failure the second part of dat is attention to detail it's something that i see a lot of people miss and I'll explain why these three components work and, and how it can affect anything that you're doing in life. And then the third is time management. So I love the fact that you touched on time. Here's how it works. Um, if I am going to a gym, let's start off with missing the component that I love the most, discipline. I am not disciplined to go to the gym. It's simple, I'm not going to the gym. <laughs> it's, that's done. So my, those gears don't turn. If you can imagine that, you need these gears to turn to unlock your success. I locked discipline by not going game over. I failed already. It's not going or not that I failed, but I'm not allowing myself to be visibly successful. Okay. Let's throw d uh, discipline back into the cog. Let's put it back into the wheel. Now it's working again. I am disciplined. I will go, but I have no attention to detail. So I'm disciplined. I'll show up. Um, I've managed my time. I've made time to show up but I am missing attention to detail. That means that the time invested doesn't carry any weight, mind the pun. It's not useful. So if you're disciplined to show up to work and you've made time to show up to work, but you didn't pay attention to the details and you make no money at work, that's not called a good day. That's called wasting those hours of your life that you'll never get back doing something that didn't serve or, or was a benefit to you all because you lack the attention to detail. I oftentimes like to use this analogy for the gym because I find it for gym goers and people like it makes a lot of sense. If you're disciplined to show up to the gym, you've managed your time, but you do all the exercises wrong. You're not going to see the results that you're looking for. Your body's not going to grow or change in the way that you want. So if you're someone who's overweight and you're disciplined to go to the gym, I see this a lot where over, overweight people, man, are incredible to me um, and how their desire and willingness to show up day in and day out to do something to get better, but are, are lacking the attention to detail so they don't get the results that they're looking for, but they try so hard. Sometimes I, I find people at the beginning are the most incredible because they're, they literally work so much harder than they even, you don't need to work that hard actually. It's not that, this is a marathon. It's not like a, it's going to take time. So just chill out. Let's get into it. But we all want to change immediately. So we're willing to do pretty extreme stuff. Um, so nevertheless, so if your attention to detail isn't working at the gym, you don't see the results that you want. You go do cardio for three minutes. That will never change your life. 
Maybe you need to do it longer. Maybe you need to lift weights or maybe you got to pick the right thing. So we can see how that works. Let's add discipline and attention to detail back into our wheel. So you're disciplined to go and you are willing and know how to do all those exercises perfectly or anything for that matter. You know how to do whatever it is perfectly, but you didn't manage your time. You have three minutes to do it. <laughs> you're screwed. That's why to me, those are the three fundamental principles or components to this gear system in order for people to really see how successful you are. Let's put all them back together. I'm disciplined to show up for myself every day, the gym, food, everything. I've paid attention to the details, meaning I actually know how much food to the, to the gram I can have in a day. If I want to gain weight, lose weight, stay the same way. I can control all of that. It's all in my control. It's like a bank account and I know exactly how much savings I have and how much I can spend. And I'm willing to manage my time to invest in myself, to make sure that I can do all of that. Because what good is the discipline and knowledge if you're not willing to put the time in to use it? So I manage my time. And when I don't, like in cases like when I was just on tour, I didn't manage my time efficiently and therefore my components all didn't work. I was disciplined, yeah, I had the desire, and I know all the attention to detail. I know how to do everything pretty much the best that I can do it to get to the next level. I just didn't manage the time. So, <coughs> excuse me, that's how I see an easy way to understand what it is you're trying to do. And you can apply this philosophy to anything you're doing in your life. I call it just doing that. Am I doing that? <clears throat> and if you can say, yeah, I've been disciplined, I'm here, and I know everything I need to do, and I've managed my time, I've got the time to do it. If it's not working, you need to go back and check. It likely is one of those things that aren't working for you. you probably, will probably end up being attention to detail. If you're disciplined showing up and you've made the time, but you're not seeing the results, it usually is in the finer things and those details that you're like, oh, yeah, I was spending a couple bucks more than I had. I didn't realize that. <laughs> yeah. You know? So that's, that, that really helped me when I put those together and, and really kind of sussed out what it was that I felt led me to success and what was the driving force behind it. And that was the philosophy I came up with because I, I realized that those were the things that I was doing that really helped me get to the next level of my fitness and life and health. You know, I went from fat to six pack and it was, it was crazy. And that's, I mean, that's a whole other conversation for people out there because don't think that success will give you what you want. It's a really interesting thing that you need to be realistic with. There's something called perceptual and visual adaptation. I looked in the mirror with a six pack and didn't know that I was smaller or more fit than when I was fat. It never stops. You can, I can lose a gram more of fat. I can make a dollar more today. I can, at some point, it's about drawing a line in the sand and just realizing what it is your goal is and making it a real goal. So don't say, I want to be skinny. That's No, that's not right, in my opinion. I would like to be fit and healthy and then define what those things are. I would like to be in good health where a doctor could give me a clear bill of health that I'm healthy. I'd like my cholesterol to be normal and my, all my enzymes in my body to be perfect. And then... I would like to have abs, or I would like to be more muscular, or I would like to um, be able to take my shirt off and feel confident for the first time. And picking what those look like and identifying them. For me, what helped me is I wanted to be 10% body fat. So I worked towards that goal. When I hit 10%, I didn't feel any better than, than what I was at 15. I just felt really good that I actually committed to something for the first time and made the goal. And then once I made that goal, I went, oh, okay, where, where do I go next? Well, um, I think I want to put on a little muscle and try that now. <clears throat> so it's just that process. But like we spoke about earlier, it's progression. And progression is part of reinventing yourself every time. Just because you've made it doesn't mean that you don't get to reinvent yourself. If you won the lottery today, you've given up on life because you finally made it, you're successful. If you got your dream job today, is that it? Is it curtains? We call it quits because you got it. You know, your dream job is just a platform for you to get to the next level that you're going to create in your head. So keep that in mind because at every level, you're not going to feel like you made it. Like, I feel like that every day. Most days, I don't know how the hell I'm going to write another song. If I, I'm, sometimes I wake up going, how, how, how does a song get written? It's like, it's like I forget everything in my sleep. And slowly but surely, I get back in it, pick up my guitar or play the keyboard and like, oh, okay, there it is. Like, 
I can do this. And then my goal becomes, I want to make another piece of art, an extension of myself. So it's like my Jenga of life. And eventually it's going to topple, like you said, at some point it's going to end anyway. So it's just enjoy putting those blocks in place. Enjoy this trip because that's what it is. You spend your whole time worrying about the, going home on the vacation. You're not going to enjoy the vacation. This is a vacation. Enjoy every day. Man, words of wisdom. Right? I, yeah. <laughs> so I'm taking up all the space now. No, man. I, when, we started, when we started this phone call, you're like, yeah, 15 minutes. We don't, we don't need much time. No, but <laughs> man, I think we're getting exactly what, we, you know, what the intention of this was. And it's really to just get a message out there to people that, you know, people are going through stuff every single day and it, it can be bad and severe and all that sort of stuff. But there's always someone that cares. And, you know, even if you get to the point where you were at, you know, <coughs> you know I can't say I've ever experienced it. Um, but you can come back from that. You can turn your life around and if, if you want to, and, you know, obviously that, uh, yeah. the, you know, you seek help, sort help, sorry, seek. Um, and, you know, you, committed to the change you started learning about ways to make it easier for your mind not just constantly battling against it so you know choosing better food and more exercise and probably even changing your your friendship group and hanging around people who inspired you totally. to be better and do more and you know it's just all these little to me like gems that you've just delivered through this chat that you know if people watching this can just take away one thing like just one thing to inspire them or work on to want to be better or want to get out of a rut they may be in or whatever it is you're going through you know that's that's what my intention is for this call you know and everything that you've shared i'm going to be watching this again over and over because it's so <laughs> and i really appreciate you giving you know aaron a bit of your time now i know you're busy about to go hit german <laughs> hey you know what somebody gave me time and that that was the biggest gift it's the one thing that you can't get back. It's the most valuable asset you have. Most of us sell our time for less than what it takes to buy it back. Your hourly wage, if I said to you, okay, I'd like to buy an hour of your life, you're not going to sell it to me for what you make at your job. So I'm, this is an investment. And I, I appreciate you saying thank you. And I appreciate the, the, how grateful you are to have my time. And I'm equally grateful to have yours. I think you're an incredible champion. Um, in what you're doing. I love watching your videos. I love seeing how you interact with your girlfriend and your family and your friends. Like I love seeing how much you actually care and put out there. That's what you do every day. You exude that. I'm trying something. I'm not perfect. But I'm trying my best. I love that. So this is an investment. This, this, is, this is a very selfish call because you've just allowed me the opportunity to talk about myself and allowed me to feel loved and accepted and appreciated. So this is a very selfish, my first intention is it's a selfish investment because it gives me something completely and entirely, fills my heart up and I'm gonna go out into the world today and, and radiate that and give it back to the world. So, and the second thing is it's selfless because I think this information can really, and I'm sure you do too, that's why you do this with people, this information can change someone's life. I know it changed mine. I know it's changed yours. These, this information that we carry, all of us, is an awesome piece to share with every single person. Because look, it's a rat race and it is so confusing. I don't know the answers and I'm not gonna sit here and sell them to you for $39.99 a month. Like, it's like, these, these, this is how life works. This is what it feels like. And this is an open source conversation. And the thing is you can spend a bit of, I'm not saying money's bad. I think money is fine. I think if you want up close and personal with someone who can give you a lot of their attention, pay for them to help you out with your goals. Otherwise this type of stuff, listen to it. And if this helps motivate the spark that lights that determination up inside of your body and helps fire that discipline, if it helps fire you up to pay attention, if it helps fire you up to manage your time better, great. Because these are the things that helped source my life out and I'm sure they've helped source yours. So at the end of the day, it's a privilege and an honor to share an opportunity to communicate with another person halfway around the world about stuff that we're all eager and passionate about. 
between the Instagram posts and our high flying lifestyles and the big jobs and big money and this girl and that guy. And this is the shit that really matters because I've seen millionaires look at themselves in despair and not want their lives to work either. And I've seen poor and broken people at the bottom of the rung, happy and smiling. It's like this kicks the shit out of all of us at some point. So it's like, we are all in the same pot. I don't care who you are and what you've done. You are not invincible to feeling. We're all going to feel it. So this is a talk that we can share amongst us all. It doesn't matter who you are, color, ethnicity, gender, sexual, any, it doesn't matter. This is what it's like to be human. This is what it's like to be vulnerable. And it is scary as all hell, but it's wonderful. I, I have no clue how to figure it all out, but what I can tell you is I'm active and I hope this conversation leads to someone who can beat it and add to it and help make this stronger and come back and say, hey, I saw this and have you ever thought of this? Blow my mind. I'm desperate for people to be included in this conversation because you know what if you have a trick or a tip that helps you with your anxiety i want to know it and if you have a way that you see your depression in a way that's beautiful tell me because i'm always trying to find ways to make my thing beautiful these are my gifts and they're scars and they're beautiful and i love them and they're mine and i know other people have them too so i want it's kind of like to, to kind of close off how i feel it's much like when you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a superhero guy. I've always loved the, the thoughts of superheroes, but I always found it was kind of like X-Men where like every single person, like when, when uh, Professor X goes into, uh, I think it's called Cerebral and he, he sees it. There's these mutants all around the world. I identified with that. I'm like, I'm a mutant. I have this like genetic twist in my brain that works differently than some people. And I felt so empowered. I was like, yeah, like, and the more I see that there are people like me who have special gifts and talents, I get so excited. I'm like, yeah, we're not alone. It's when people walk around trying to be perfect and presenting themselves as that, I get kind of scared and I'm like, ah, oh, that's where I feel most vulnerable. So tell me you're crazy. Tell me you're a freak. Tell me you're nuts. Tell me you have no clue who you are inside your body. Tell, tell me you're a young person not sure of, of your sexual identity. Tell me you're... Uh, an old person who's not sure you live life right. Tell me you're depressed like crazy. Tell me you're Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It's an open place and I love you so much. It's like, like bring up, Katie Lang is a really um, famous Canadian artist. I remember at the Junos, I was with her. Well, not, I met her, I was with her, but I was watching her um, get up and she was getting like a lifetime achievement thing. And she got up and she, she's, she's part of the gay community. And, she, she felt, I think, oppressed for a long time and wasn't able to kind of just be herself in fear of a backlash and repercussion. And she stood up on the stage in, in, an, in, a, in an arena full of people. And I love this. So to quote Katie Lang, she just got up and said, let your freak flag fly. And I loved that. It's never left my mind. It's like, it's okay to be a freak and embrace it. It's what makes you awesome. So... Yeah, let your freak flag fly. You are the man. And this, yeah, this recording is going to impact a lot of people, your story, um, which is exactly the reason why I wanted to share it with my network. Um, because I still remember when we were at, I can't even remember where the gig was, and you did that video. In for Berlin. Me. Berlin. Yeah, I still, got it on my, I still got it on my phone. <laughs> Love that picture. For the mental health, um, you did a little spiel as well. And, you know, obviously we're doing Movember and stuff as well. And it's always what I'm working towards and wanting to educate my community about is just how we can do it. Obviously <coughs> two passions is nutrition and exercise. And the main one being how to use that and direct that to help people with their, you know, mental well being and your story, man, your weight loss journey and what you've been through is the, the perfect, you know, educational source, I believe you know, for people to hear. So yeah. Uh, I did. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Man That Can Project podcast. My name is Lockie Stewart, and I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it helpful. If you did, please take a moment to rate and review the Man That Can Project on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our newest episodes. We'll see you again next time.